Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for joining us today, um, to, tonight, if, uh, depending on where you're, you're located. Uh, thank you for, for um, joining us for having an accent in type design with Alexander Samalenko. Uh, my name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors on the Type of Cooper program, and this is the fourth uh, spring lecture in the Herbal Balance Lecture Series, uh, jointly presented by the Herbal Balance Study Center and Type of Cooper, both of which are part of uh, Cooper Union. Uh, uh, Type of Cooper is the postgraduate certificate program in typeface design uh, with uh, workshops in typography, calligraphy, lettering, uh, and many other things um, that uh, you should you should know about if you're not familiar. Um, if you don't, um, I'll keep posting links in the chat as we go along so you can have reference to it. Um, we also, um, uh, Type of Cooper and the Balance Center also presents the um, annual uh, typographics conference. So that's another link for folks. Um, it's going to be our ninth edition. Um, we've been we've been running that that event uh, for eight years now, uh, ninth year, uh, second post COVID in person uh, event. So we have a really great lineup <clears throat> being put together. Most of the speakers are published. Um, you can see some of the some of the names that have been revealed uh, at the, at this link here. But um, grab a ticket, and we hope to see you in person in in June, yeah, mid June in New York City. Uh, for those who celebrate, uh, wishing everyone a happy and peaceful Ramadan, Easter, and Passover. Also, happy spring. I think we're fully in the mid midst of spring, depending on on, on uh, your hemisphere. But uh, certainly uh, nice to be in in the spring, in closing out the lecture series. Uh, in in the month of uh, in the in the season of spring, um, I also wanted to um, thank uh, Type Culture uh, for their generosity in in sponsoring the recordings of these these talks. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Type Culture is a Type Foundry by the award winning Typeface designer Mark Jammer. It is also a, a fantastic academic resource for students, educators, and designers who are looking to. Uh, uh, find more information about typefaces, so definitely um, check that out. So, once again, thanks for uh, for that uh, um, sponsorship and and generosity for type uh, culture to allow us uh, to record these lectures. If you missed any of the talks uh, we've had this cycle in the spring, or any of the previous talks we've had, uh, uh, let's see, this is our twelfth year, thirteenth year of. Uh, Type of Cooper lectures, so there's there's a nice uh, healthy uh, archive of of talks going back uh, several years, uh, and you can find them in two places. You can find them in our website, embedded into the talks, um, posting links to that, um, which you can see on screen, uh, and and Vimeo um, special channel for the Type of Cooper lectures. A lot of the previous typographics talks are also on there. We will have more talks um, in the summer. Uh, we'll have four more lectures in the, in the summer. So uh, keep an eye on that. You can go to that website, um, uh, type, uh, coopertype.org slash lectures. You can find uh, um, a mailing list subscription. So if you wanted to keep up with, with what um, we have coming up, you can check that out. Um, and also keep an eye on social media. We tend to uh, advertise a lot through newsletters and through, through social media. So. Um, that is um, going to be uh, public as soon as we have the final lineup for the summer put together. Uh, so soon you will have former lectures. So we look forward to seeing you there. Um, now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, today's um, presenter. Uh, once again, welcome to uh, Having an Accent in Type Design. Uh, Alexander Samalenkova, who's joining us uh, today, is a Latvian-born type designer who's based in the Netherlands. Uh, she studied visual communications in Riga and Berlin and graduated from the Type Media program in uh, KBK in The Hague. Alexander designs for Latin, uh, Cyrillic, and occasionally Greek. She consults on the former two scripts. She's known for her award-winning Cyrillic and Greek extensions for some notable typefaces, including uh, IBM Plex, uh, which is on so many platforms these days, um, and a few other typefaces, and also her typeface Pilot, uh, which is one of the few typefaces which has been cast in metal. 
Uh, Alexandra specializes in designing diacritics and special characters for the Latin script, uh, something that she consults on extensively, and also lectures. Um, and this is certainly one of the one of the talks that kind of delves into that into that topic. So it's it's really a wonderful pleasure to have Alexandra here with us to present uh, having an accent in type design. So with that, I will turn it over to Alexandra. Thanks, Alexandra, for have, for for being here with us. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha, for wonderful introduction and uh, even more so for the invitation to give a talk here. It's a great honor and great pleasure. Uh, so I think it's a good moment to share my screen and start the presentation. So hello, everyone. Uh, it's very nice that you joined me tonight, today. Uh, uh, Indeed, as Sasha already uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I was born and raised in Latvia, where I lived for the first 22 years of my life. The next eight years I spent in Berlin, in Germany. First I studied there, then I worked uh, at Lucas Font, uh, a type design studio. Uh, and now I'm happily settled in the Netherlands, in the city uh, of Harlem. And this is my name, Alexandra Solenkova, uh, with a comma accent in it, because that's how my name is written in the Latvian language, uh, with in accordance with with the Latvian orthography, uh, Latvian is a Latin-based language with quite a few diacritical marks. Uh, I only got one, but uh, uh, many Latvians are luckier and they have a few in their names. Uh, my name, however, is not a typical Latvian name since I was born in a Russian-speaking family in Latvia, and together with all my uh, um, uh, together with with, with changing uh, of, of 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 places where I lived, uh, explaining my background often requires at least a few iterations. Uh, and sometimes, in order to answer a simple question, "Where are you from?" I need rather a sentence than just one word. Which, of course, nowadays is quite a trivial thing because people do move uh, to other countries and. Uh, uh, don't necessarily live where they were born. What is not a trivial thing is to be sharing one's first language with the language of the aggressor's country, which invaded uh, and partly occupied occupied another country and is committing war crimes there almost every day. That's a very repulsive experience, I must say. And obviously I'm referring to the ongoing full-blown war Russian Federation uh, waged on Ukraine in 2022. So the comma accent uh, in my name, a Latvian diacritical mark, uh, it always has been very dear to me. But during the last year, it became quite a big deal as um, the small topographic detail is key to my background and it connects me to my home country, Latvia. I grew up with two scripts around me, uh, a diacritically rich Latin for the Latvian language, uh, which was everywhere around me, and Cyrillic for the Russian language I spoke at home. Just to avoid any confusion, Russian is not an official language in Latvia. So predictably, my bi-scriptural past shaped my current field of interest and expertise in type. I faced practical problems caused by the diacritical marks very early in my life when I was learning to read uh, and to write. Uh, and you can imagine that playing with those uh, plastic letters, um, plastic magnet letters that you're supposed to put uh, on the fridge uh, in different words. So playing with them, you learn the hard way that the comma accent, for example, is the one to break first, uh, or or that the Karen, the Karen often is too heavy and it will turn the whole letter upside down. I cannot say that these particular problems uh, uh, are uh, something to be aware of in the digital type design nowadays, but using a diacritically rich alphabet on a daily basis made me at least pay some special attention to the letters beyond the basic Latin alphabet. Uh, in the long run, 
through the years of my type design work, uh, I collected quite some knowledge and quite some experience about the accents and, and, and special characters. And by special characters, I mean the characters that are not accented characters, but also do, are not included in the basic A to Z English or Latin alphabet. Uh, so I accumulated quite some knowledge uh, and even for the languages I don't speak myself, which is easy because I don't speak all that many languages. And I'm happily sharing this practical information in my diacritics related workshops nowadays. And I always preach not to consider diacritics as something to do at the end, you know, as part of the production process when you think that your basic Latin is just 100% done. Um, the presence of the diacritics uh, uh, can change appearance of a typeface or a text set in a typeface. So it's crucial to have them early enough in your process and to test the typeface constantly with plenty of languages, which your character set is covering, because that way there will be no unpleasant discoveries at the last moment when tomorrow you have to publish uh, a typeface. Or, well, there will be some discoveries, but not so many unpleasant discoveries. Uh, you know, anyway, the font market is global nowadays, and the chance that your typeface will be used for a language that is not English is pretty high. And the majority of those non-English languages do contain do contain some of the accented letters, at least. I work a lot with the Cyrillic script as well. Uh, I consult on Cyrillic quite often. And that's how my comments usually look like. Uh, I, I, I blurred the typeface itself so that the client can stay anonymous, but the, the, the blurring is not part of the consult. I must say that it's extremely energy consuming affair <laughs> activity. Uh, you, you cannot try things out, uh, let them stick around for a while, uh, come back tomorrow, change your mind. Your, your, your word has to be definitive ish, definitive ish has to be. Uh, I design also Cyrillic extensions for the existing Latin typefaces. And while I have zero legitimate reason to do so, I also design Greek sometimes. And I think the logic behind it is, you know, in for an inch, in for a mile, if you design Cyrillic, why, why not design Greek? Which is very bad logic, but it works. And I believe that gives me a good perspective uh, on the topic of being native to a script you design for. Because I'm not even nearly native to Greek, uh, but I'm native to Cyrillic. And that's how I know what a native designer feels seeing their script treated uh, by a non-native colleague. And I also know how it feels to be that non-native colleague butchering someone else's script. So perhaps that's why I'm so occupied with the uh, problematics of being native versus having an accent or being native and having an access, accent in type design specifically. Uh, you know, being native to a script, uh, an alphabet or even a single letter doesn't mean that you are not designing them with a certain accent. It's very likely that such an accent is not only your individual view on the subject. It probably reflects typographic culture you grew in, the things you have seen as a child. And yeah, the, the, the answer, what is nativeness, nativity in the context of type design also needs uh, an answer. And my answer is, well, the, the obvious answer is that being native to a script or to an orthography means to be born and raised in the culture that uses that script or orthography. But how do you benefit from it as a type designer? And my answer is very uh, straightforward. I think that you benefit your, your benefits of being raised with a particular script uh, in your environment is simply to have been exposed to a huge number of instances of that script. In other words, you have seen the letters of your writing system infinitely many times, uh, printed, handwritten, handmade, carved in stone, embroidered, uh, old, modern, uh, professionally executed, amateur made, uh, you have seen it all. And perhaps 
that exposure has to happen when you're learning the concept of reading and writing in general. But I'm not sure about that. That's also out of my competence. It's just my guess about what, what nativeness and type design is. So having that luggage, which you might not be even conscious about that, that you have it, uh, it does not, doesn't make you a typographic expert of your script. Uh, we still have to learn about uh, type design and uh, uh, peculiarities of your own script, consciously as 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 any non-native designers would do as well. But still, that storage room of images that 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 we acquired while growing up uh, with a script uh, will definitely help us to make typographic choices efficiently and quickly. Uh, I think that that will help us uh, more easily orient in in in, in typographic uh, context. Uh, for example, we'll immediately catch uh, historical, socio-political, stylistic refer references reflected in the piece of type. <clears throat> and one can probably say that it is impossible not to be native to the Latin script nowadays, at least to some extent. Uh, since uh, uh, here is a good chance that you will be intensely exposed to Latin, even if you are growing up in a different writing system. However, taking into account the immense vastness of the Latin script, even if you are an experienced type designer native to one of the Latin based alphabets, there still will be plenty of Latin characters you might not know enough about or you know, sometimes it happens that you just learn about a Latin character and you never, never, never imagine that it exists. And that is your own script you're native to. So just, just, just scratching the surface, not many perfectly native to Latin type designers know that uh, the construction of the Polish L slash or Latvian G comma accent is changing rather unpredictably in handwriting. Uh, so it's 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 not the same diacritical marks, uh, the, not the same diacritical mark uh, as in Roman or even in Italic. In handwriting, it's it's a third a third option. Uh, well, you, you you might know about these two particular ones uh, if you participated in my diacritic workshops, but it's still just drop in the huge Latin ocean. And. When we are talking about nativity to and therefore authority on a particular writing system, particular script, I'm always curious who has more authority over the characters that are shared by several languages. Uh, just in case there is any disagreement among the native readers of these two potential cultures uh, uh, about how, how those diacritical marks should look like, and not that I know of any disagreements for the diuresis, but in case there were some, whose preferences should be used as default in a font? I mean, we can always add some local uh, alternates, but but still, which ones should go uh, as, as, as default? Those who use it in large doses at a time, like, like Finnish-speaking uh, people, or, or those who might have used it for a longer time, like German-speaking people, those who have more speakers or readers, uh, or those who have more readers who are willing to pay for the funds, or maybe those who's, uh, who, who, who are more politically inf influential, uh, or, or I don't know, simply have nuclear weapon, maybe that's, you know, yeah. So the shape of the diuresis luckily doesn't cause many disagreements, but the placement of the diuresis and other dots, and not only dots, actually does. So the, the, the basic Latin alphabet proudly uh, features one diacritical mark, and it's even arguable whether it's, it is diacritical mark, but it's a loose part, and you know, it's, it's, it plays a role of a diacritical mark anyway, so it's a dot on the eye. And designers usually draft the eye early in the design process, and it seems that choosing the vertical position of the dot, many of them consider many factors, but not the most crucial one, in my opinion, uh, the vertical placement of the dot will influence the vertical position of many hundreds of other diacritical marks. You see, the acceptable vertical position 
of the dot on the eye is not really one point, it's a range. Some designers prefer to sit higher, some prefer it to be placed closer to the X height. And position of the rest of the diacritical marks is also a range, but it's much smaller range. The dioreses can sit higher or lower, but you know, you 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 don't want it to sit that high. I'm pretty sure, sure all dioreses users will <clears throat> agree it uh, it looks rather ridiculous. Uh, and you know, the, the dot on the eye might be on the high side here, but it's still kind of acceptable position. You you wouldn't you wouldn't show it, you wouldn't uh, yeah, you wouldn't laugh at it. Uh, so for example, in German language typography, setting the diuresis visibly lower than the dot on the eye is quite a common practice. Uh, in case uh, a type designer is insisting that the dot on the eye should sit so high as, as it does here, um, it's all right to set the diuresis lower and just be done with that. However, nowadays we rarely design or use fonts that support solely one language as it's uh, it, it, it might have uh, might have happened in, in in the era of the metal fonts or in the early dig digital era but nowadays the font cover many languages usually so the reasons will have to coexist in the same alphabet with some other diacritical marks and you know those different diacritical marks better be optically aligned and for many readers, diacritical marks that are placed inconsistently with the dot on the eye is a problem. Especially those users who use a single dot accent on top of other letters than I, like Lithuanian or Polish uh, language speakers. Single dot accent is basically the same thing as dot on the eye. Uh, same shape, same size. It should be the same placement. But in case there is a discrepancy between the dot on the I and the rest of the accents, there is no good choice you can make. Whether you put that accent, single dot accent, uh, whether, you, whether you align it with, 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 with a dot on the I or uh, with the rest of the diacritical marks, it won't be good. Uh, in any case, it will be some kind of a karaoke bouncing ball effect. The, the, the critics will kind of jump in a line of text uh, or even in one word. And it's incredibly annoying. And imagine that all drama uh, in one script. At the end, it's so much easier to choose the placement or the dot on the eye, keeping in mind all the accent that will be dependent on that decision. And you know, maybe hold back a little bit on one designer's ego urging to put the dot on the eye higher than it would be comfortable for the rest of the diacritical marks. But the Greek script is at least sparing us that kind of trouble. Uh, it's one script serving one language, the modern Greek. And Greek indeed is spoken in some other places than Greece, but still it's uh, the same language. And of course there is Polytonic Greek, uh, which features more diacritics than the uh, modern Greek, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's used for the ancient Greek and that language is more or less dead. And it means there are no native readers to complain. <clears throat> Relatively speaking, Greek has a lot in common with both Latin and Cyrillic, which is no surprise since Greek is a common ancestor for both, both of them. Greek, Latin, and Cyrillic, they have the same uh, writing and reading, reading direction. Uh, they feature upper and lower case, there is capitalization, and there is there are even plenty of uh, overlapping graphemes like alpha, a, and a in, in, in all three scripts is, is the same, and there are more of those. Uh, there are also some obvious differences. Uh, the Greek script generally has many open, rounded shapes with plenty of generous and asymmetric counters. And there is also, you know, flexible 
what you call metrics and, and, and the baseline is rather supple. It's, it's not as strict as in Latin and Cyrillic. It's, it's, it's slightly, slightly more, uh, sh it's shifting more visibly. Uh, and these qualities on average make Greek look airier, more fluid, more, uh, more, you know, handwritten, if you, if, if you like, uh, uh, than, than, than Latin. And especially then Cyrillic, because Cyrillic, uh, uh, you know, with with abundance of the straight stems and rectangular counters, uh, it looks very rigid, much more rigid than 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 the Latin. Yeah, Latin is somewhere in the middle in airiness and and fluidity between between Cyrillic and Greek. So, what happens if the character of the typeface is in conflict? with the character of the script. Which one should be prioritized? Uh, in 2021, I was asked to design a Greek extension for the upright masters of Forma DGR banner, a wonderful revival of uh, Aldo Novarez's neo-grotesque uh, Forma by David Jonathan Ross. And you probably already see that the most obvious feature of this typeface is its outrageously tight spacing. It's very typical for, well, late 60s, 70s. Uh, and you, you cannot take it away because the, then, then, then the character of the typeface will be also taken away. And, you know, tight spacing uh, and the amount of the straight sided letters in Latin. Uh, the, together, they create uh, a very distinctive and dense pattern of the text. Um, also, apertures are nicely closed, and and that supports that that very particular pattern. So, my task was to make these features work in the Greek script, which I will remind you uh, is often described as airy, fluid, uh, uh, featuring supple vertical metrics and baseline. And here I have to make a little deviation from the story uh, so that, 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 that the further development is a little bit uh, more clear to you. In the early digital font design era, making of the fonts became accessible to everyone. So Greek and Cyrillic font markets were rapidly filling with, let's say, native but amateur Greek and Cyrillic extensions uh, of the Latin fonts, as well as with the Greek and Cyrillic extensions by professional but script-ignorant non-native designers. And to put it mildly, those creations were questionable. Um, you know, parts of, of of Latin letters often were used to to slap together some 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 kind of uh, uh, creatures resembling a Greek or Cyrillic letter. And in Greek, sometimes Latin letters were simply used instead of the proper Greek ones. For example, uh, uh, S for the final sigma, uh, X for the he, and dotless uh, I uh, as as a iota. Uh, and a slightly lesser but very common offense was to omit the in and exit strokes in letters like eta, p, tough, me, he, uh, and and many others. Uh, what, pretty much what you see uh, happening in, in 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 the animation. And it's important to remember that those in and 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 exit strokes uh, in Greek are not really just an optional detail that you can choose to omit easily. Like you know, like the 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 exit stroke in the Latin hockey stick L, but in Greek it's part of the construction of the letter and it's part of the grapheme. So nowadays, as much as I know, there are two camps within the professional Greek type community. Some designers see those liberties taken to Greek <laughs> as some kind of undeniable evil and savage. Latinization and degradation of the script. And the others see it as an opportunity for evolution, which could help Greek adapt better to the modern typographic styles. 
And I personally see the logic of both perspectives, but my non-nativeness to the script makes me a much bigger conformist or even formalist in Greek than in Cyrillic or Latin. Uh, you know, you, you 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 can take questionable design decisions out of ignorance or out of arrogance. And I am probably not all that ignorant anymore, but I am also not nearly arrogant uh, when 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 uh, when talking about Greek. So I'm somewhere in between. Uh, and in Forma DGR, I face the choice either to prioritize the properties of the typeface or the essence of the script. And in a practical sense, it boiled down uh, to the question whether eta, he should feature in strokes and alpha and me exit strokes or not. You, you, you can see those four letters uh, uh, on the screen. And leaving out those strokes often goes together with omitting the exit strokes in P or TAF or Yota, but that, that I didn't dare to think about it. It, 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 it would be way too drastic. Uh, 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 step for me. Uh, but indeed, leaving out strokes in, in, in those fours was extremely tempting. Uh, and as you can see, hopefully, uh, the, the presence or absence of those extra little exit and uh, uh, in-strokes uh, changed the appearance of the text quite a bit. And the version without those strokes had more in common with, with the Latin uh, than, than, than the one with the strokes, and probably that was because it looked less Greek and more Latin. So I nearly lost my sleep over this, which is ridiculous because there are more serious problems to, to, to be worried about. But uh, yeah, at that moment, uh, that seemed to be the question of life. And, you know, at, at, at that moment, at that time, I, I, I was considering calling a native expert. Uh, but I knew that I would have to decide who do I call, because also native experts would have different opinions about it, probably. Uh, so at the end, respect for the script uh, won, and I only sacrificed the in-stroke in he. Um, and that, that's, what, uh, that's how the former DGR Greek uh, story ended. And I think that being not native to the script influenced my willingness to prioritize the writing system, the, the, the script more than the, 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 the character of the typeface. And I cannot say I enjoyed choosing between, between those two, you know, the nature of the script and the spirit of the typeface. Uh, maybe, maybe all that uh, doubting and, and, and drama or, or, you know, a storm in a teacup, uh, uh, you might think uh, maybe it all paid off uh, as former DGR Greek got a special mention at the Grand Channel competition, which in my opinion has the most competent and versatile jury for many scripts beyond Latin. But I have to admit that now I'm, now I'm sleeping badly wondering if I would have received that special mention if I had gone for that other option. No rest for a neurotic, uh, non-native type designer. And since we're talking about the Grandchen competition, a very dear to me project, IBM Plex, uh, got the second prize uh, for Cyrillic and Greek at Grandchen as well. Uh, and I would love to think that by now everyone is familiar with this type family, but just in case you are not, IBM Plex is IBM's corporate typeface, which surprisingly is also open source, so everyone can use it for commercial or non-commercial work for free. And unlike many free fonts, this is high quality stuff made by a wonderful team I had the honor to be part of. Um, I, first on the, I, I worked on the first two scripts beyond Latin, first Cyrillic and then Greek. Uh, IBM Plex is a massive type system. Uh, there are four subfamilies, each consisting of eight weights with corresponding idyllics. And by now, the IBM Plex SANS is covering nine writing systems, and the count still goes on. Uh, the Latin part uh, was developed 
without me, uh, in close collaboration between IBM Executive Creative Director Mike, Mike Ebbing and Bold Monday, uh, a Dutch type foundry. I sometimes work with them. And the official concept of IBM Plex uh, states that IBM sees themselves as a medium between human and machine. So the keystone of IBM Plex letter shapes is the balance between the natural and the engineered. And I know that it uh, sounds, might sound as some kind of generic typeface description, like professional yet friendly. But honestly, that human plus machine approach, in my opinion, is actually visible in IBM Plex. And it's pretty cool. So in the past, in 2017 and 2018, I drew Cyrillic for the sons, serif and mono subfamilies, and Greek for the sons. And last year, Bolt Monday approached me asking again whether I would be available to do Greek for IBM Plex Serif. And I said yes at the end. I was very familiar with the whole IBM Plex project. I also did kind of a right job on the Greek for the Sans subfamily. But I knew that I will need someone with a full Greek competence to, to back me up. I said yes, with a condition that we will involve a native Greek consultant. And I knew immediately who it should be, uh, a perfect person for our perfect team. Irene, Irene Flahu, uh, you probably have heard that name because she's a very well-known Greek type designer. And if you ever need anything Greek related, like Greek extension for a typeface or a consult on Greek, uh, just call Irini. It's a, it's a pleasure to work with her. Uh, I started sketching for Greek and, and, and so did Mike Ebbing uh, because we were trying to establish for ourselves first what direction the Greek serif should take. We needed to find a common ground among ourselves and, 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 and maybe produce something to be to be shown to Irini, uh, and our first drawings were were very cautious, rather predictable, and they 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 felt somehow lifeless and insipid. Uh, at least for me, we we we, we followed the principles of the uh, existing Greek in the IBM Plex sense, was a rather regularized contrast axis. And we try to invent new elements of graphic language, of IBM Plex graphic language, that would bring some fluidity and some freshness, some life into those uh, new Greek letters. But I don't think any of us was really uh, convinced. It all felt to me as a half-hearted attempt, you know, since, since uh, all those experiments were taking place in the very safe zone of this domesticated, Latinized uh, Greek that didn't scare too much our non-native eyes. It wasn't Greek enough. I felt it had to be Greeker. It's quite amusing since I have observed that desire in many non-native designers. They 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 want to be when when, when they design Cyrillic, you know, they want to be more Catholic than the Pope himself. So more Cyrillic than the Cyrillic designers. And yet I have fallen into the same, the same kind of non-native righteousness myself designing Greek. So I started from scratch and I put together a version with the reverse contrast. It actually wasn't meant to be reverse contrast. I wanted the angle of stress to be uh, following the ductus of each later, letter. Uh, as it happens in traditional Greek typefaces, the, the, the contrast axis is kind of uh, changing from letter to letter. Uh, but IBM Plex played a joke on me. Uh, it's, it's, its mechanistic nature cried for more regularization. So somehow that stress angle that was supposed to be changing, it at the end, it, it, it fell into being just vertical all through the alphabet. Uh, well, I thought, good, that way it won't be Latinized for sure. And I felt so 
saintly about this version. I, I, I convinced Peter and Paul from Bold Bondi and, and Mike from IBM that this is what we need. And for God's sake, I, I, I already started to think about like fine details. And then I sent the PDF to our native consultant, consultant Irini, for the first time in the whole process. And I felt very virtuous. Look, Irene, how Greek is my Greek? Yeah, I couldn't be Greeker. And I kept feeling virtuous for another 24 hours until Irene's answer came, starting with the words, I don't want to discourage you from what you're doing, but maybe it would be more interesting if you would go for a hybrid model. So in my desire to be more Catholic than the Pope himself, I overshoot overshot the mark for quite a bit. And as Irini explained, such a reverse contrast for Greek is quite a strong statement by itself. And in the context, context of a corporate font with already existing styles, it's rather out of place. Uh, but that pilgrimage into the reverse contrast didn't go completely to waste. Um, some elements discovered there gave the hybrid version of IBM Plex Serif uh, Greek the liveliness and that distinctive voice it was lacking in our first drawings before, before I jumped into the, the reverse contrast uh, journey. Maybe it's just me trying to, to justify that, that pilgrimage, but, uh, you know, I, I, I truly think that it's kind of... Uh, Lit it up a little bit. And IBM Plex Serif Greek should be soon available, so you can see for yourself uh, how it turned out to be. And to finish this up, uh, generally, I think I'm not too traditional uh, uh, in type design. I, I, I cannot say I, 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 like, I, I completely lack artistic daring in, in, in type design but not when I'm dealing with Greek. Uh, and I, I always have to think about the Czech author Jaroslav Hasek and a satirical political party he founded in the beginning of the 20th century. And the party was called the party of moderate progress within the bounds of the law. So you see it on progress, but moderates and moderate, but, and, and of course it's all is within the bounds of the law. And designing Greek, I turn into a member of such a party. Uh, I bet you, you, you all know that phenomenon when your facial expression, gestures, uh, and maybe even the whole personality is changing slightly when you switch to a different language. Uh, and I think the same can happen when you design for different writing systems, because I know I can be cheeky or even frivolous in Cyrillic or Latin, not in Greek. Uh, so the Cyrillic part of IBM Plex Sans uh, contains this uh, Cyrillic letter F with well-pronounced ears. It's for some reason the, the, the F and those parts uh, in it uh, are called ears. And it's not, uh, it's not that letter F with such well-pronounced ears does not exist in Cyrillic. It does, but usually it appears in the context of uh, antiquas, uh, which are either historic or they play with, with the idea of, of being historic or old-fashioned. In sensory designs, it's more common to use this kind of F construction where, 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 where the round stroke just flows continuously through the middle stem. I think this, this, this design is quite common since, since, since 80s, uh, 1980s. Um, and if you desperately want to have visible ears uh, in, in, in your sensory F, then something more temperate and considerate uh, should be should be uh, drawn like remember the the party of moderate progress that's that's that the case, but uh, the Cyrillic IBM Plex Sans featuring the legitimate round F didn't fully match the level of the contrast, but also the level of the eccentricity of the Latin. 
And I think the reason for that was that uh, there was lack of this characteristic thin joints. It's really like like part of DNA of IBM Plex to, to, to have many of those characteristically thin joints. Uh, uh, and, and, and Cyrillic was just not having enough of them. Uh, because construction of the Cyrillic letters uh, doesn't imply many opportunities to implement this detail. So I had to invent one. And I introduced that somewhat rogue F. And I think that that way I spiced up the Cyrillic and balanced it gray with the Latin. And I think at the end it looks quite fresh. You know, a wise man once said that if something is orthodox enough, it has good chances to become trendy again. Uh, the most fun, but also the most difficult part was designing Cyrillic for IBM Plex Mono. Um, generally speaking, monospace Cyrillic is challenging. Uh, I dare say more than the monospace Latin on average, because obviously the most challenging part of the monospace design is that every glyph has to be placed within the same width. In such circumstances, white letters with three or more vertical stems cause more hassle, especially in the heavier weights where, where, where the stems become thicker and the counter smaller. You can make the stems in those three stamped letters thinner, but they will still create that, you know, fluctuations in, in, in the gray of the text, in saturation of the text. And Cyrillic just features more of those letters with three stems, and some of them are even like three and a half. So there are just more letters creating that uneven texture. And mono italics, uh, they had an additional level of difficulty because uh, uh, the Latin part of the of the IBM Plex Mono features this extremely expressive, hand, hand, almost handwritten uh, constructions for some letters, uh, which are quite unexpected uh, in 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 the Mono design, or at least they were unexpected uh, a few years ago, and that that expressiveness, the inspiration for 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 it uh, for for this expressive tone. Uh, was an interchangeable typeface called italic 12, which was used in the golf balls uh, of the iconic IBM Selectric typewriter. It didn't exist for Cyrillic, so I was on my own translating the eccentricity of the Latin into Cyrillic. I didn't have that historic base uh, to lean on. And as it goes, when you're translating a text from one language to another, some references or idioms or expressions they cannot be translated literally you, you you need to find an analogy that your audience will understand or, or will be familiar with so cyrillic handwriting stands further away from the standard cyrillic cursive than the latin handwriting stands from the latin cursive using cyrillic handwriting as a reference for mono italics would be in my opinion, even more provocative than it was in, in, in Latin. And I had to find some other means. I went for this tilde-like descending elements in Cyrillic letters T and SH. Uh, and it, they are familiar for a Cyrillic reader, but again, they're usually expected in quite a different context. The context of the archaic or manneristic antiquas or serif typefaces. And I don't think that these tales were ever applied to a monospace design. But they totally make sense in mono. Rationally, they can afford being well pronounced and elaborate uh, uh, while using the vertical space, not the precious horizontal space, you know, that 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 we are trying to uh, to save in 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 the mono uh, designs. Sometimes I think that 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 maybe they <clears throat> did turn out being too lively after all. Look at them; they 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 do what they want. 
They come home late, never tell me where they were. And I must confess, it happens to many of my letters. You know, they, they start to live the life of their own. They, they run away from home. They find dodgy friends, do dodgy things. I, I, I don't understand half of what they're doing and probably filming some stupid TikTok dances. They're not even allowed on TikTok. They only have to, must, they must stay on my Instagram and, and, and keep some distancey. But uh, I don't know what, 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 what they're doing when I'm not looking. And this particular ones have run away from a project called uh, To Poesy. It's spelled with three Ys, just for fun. And in English, it would be Thai poetry. Uh, this was a project organized by Graphic Matters, a Dutch design platform engaged in and organizing a lot of interesting and experimental design and art stuff. And this project involved several type and lettering designers or design collectors, as well as several contemporary Dutch poets. A designer and a poet would uh, would would be work working together and 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 produce a series of the poetic posters. <clears throat> Those posters would be then exhibited in on on, on the streets uh, of of various cities in in Belgium and the Netherlands. And the whole two poesy project was inspired by an expressionist slash deadest poetry book Bezette Stadt, uh, which means occupied city, written by a Flemish author Paul van van Ostein. Uh, the, the, the 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 so he he wrote the poetry and uh, his colleague and friend uh, artist and typesetter Oscar uh, Jespers. Uh, Put the 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 so-called rhythmical typography that he embodied the the so-called rhythmical typography Paul van Ostein wanted for his poems. So he typeset the book. Um, it was published in 1921, and the poems in this collection are about Antwerp, uh, van Ostein's home city, uh, which was under the German occupation during the First World War, and. Accidentally, I was still working on my posters a few days before Russia invaded Ukraine, and even then, I couldn't, I couldn't think that that you know the idea of an occupied city will become such a horrible reality so close home and so soon. That was absolutely unthinkable. I <clears throat> for 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 my posters, I got to work with the lines of the wonderful Dutch poetess Eliane van Elderen, and I don't dare to enter, interpret her poetry verbally because it's too far out of my competence, but what I saw there was a sincere, authentic, and humorous, wonderfully humorous take on transition from childhood to adolescence, uh, the, the edginess and intensity of the process. And to render Elian's uh, poignant, poignant uh, line, uh, words, I developed a lettering style, which you see in front of you, which I prefer to describe as awkward, reckless, naive, wild, inconvenient, and genuine. And the style is my own take on adolescence, memories of which I prefer to enjoy from the safe distance of my current age. I would not want to go back. So it was an, a wonderful experiment for me uh, because I could put aside any typographic neurotism and just let my subconsciousness do the work. And okay, as, as I found out, my subconsciousness is rather well-trained, but still it, it got to play. And I deliberately tried not to rationalize while I was working. Uh, uh, but now I think that the menace of the war in the future made it more made it more desperate than 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 the memory of the war in the past could have done alone. There is a certain a certain desperation, uh, uh, I think, there. And here are the posters in the wild. Uh, they they were printed a zero, quite big, 
And the rough translation goes, uh, if you wait long enough, your longing will turn into doubt whether you didn't make it all up by yourself, split in three pieces. I also lettered another quote from another Elian's uh, poem, and again, literally translated. It doesn't 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 make it justice, but literally translated, it says, "Behind the power transformer on the loan, we are exchanging our tamagotchi for a pocket knife." And I don't have much to add to this. I think it's just brilliant. Uh, the same poster was also reprinted very nicely, A2, uh, in neon. And uh, I'm a little ashamed to confess, but 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 our curator Dennis Albert had to coach me quite a bit not to leave it black and white as I usually do when when I can. So not not that I'm allergic to color or anything, but I kind of love the maximal contrast of black and white. And I believe a few copies might be still available at the Graphic Matters online shop just in case your wall is asking for a colorful Dutch accent. And as a wise man once said, a good piece of neon print lettering can bring more joy than a whole variable font. And talking about variable fonts, sometimes they do bring joy after all, even if, they're, if they have no other use really. Uh, in 2019, Minju Ham, my friend and colleague, invited a couple of type designers to participate in a um, Korean typography biennale, Taipo Yanchi. It's just amazing that such a biennale exists. And both I and my partner, Just von Rosso, we were among those designers. Uh, we were asked to create an experimental variable font, which would be pushing the boundaries of the variable font technology. Uh, not a proper font, really, just a few letters uh, uh, in, in case pushing the boundaries went too far. Uh, so I was asked to do Cyrillic and use was expected to work on, on, on Latin. Uh, and luckily, it was just one word we needed to set in the font. Uh, we, we we weren't initially we weren't supposed to collaborate, but so so, so I and used we uh, we started working on our stuff separately, and I blew off the dust from my old robot Python sketch from 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 long time ago. And the 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 principle of that robot Python script was as following: um, you feed a Bezier contour to that script. And the script will flatten the Bezier curve to straight segments. And those straight segments, the, 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 the points where they meet, uh, they will define an amount of points on the curve. And the shorter are the segments, the more points there will be. And the tricky part was to distribute those points evenly and, and, and used to help me with that back then, long time ago. And now the script would offset those newly created points in two directions and would connect them with, with a visible <laughs> Bezier curve, creating some kind of a spiral. So I looked at that sketch and I thought, maybe the extreme position of that spiral could serve as extremes for a variable font. And I suspected it might be possible, but technically it was far beyond my skill. Uh, well, I already mentioned Just von Rossum, right? So the, luckily, I live with someone native to the Python language, uh, and and Just von Rossum is the 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 the, the person I, I meet, and I ask him whether it would be humanly possible, and whether he wanted maybe to collaborate uh, uh, on this for the Taipo Yanji project, and both answers were positive, and. Uh, a few hours later, well, maybe a few days later, you just wrote a tool one could use in Robofont. Uh, the tool generates a preview of the spiral stalks around the Bezier contour, and you can edit the contour, and the spiral will react live, which is pretty cool. And it has uh, a user's interface. And yeah, and, and, and you can see that the parameters of the spiral could be adjusted with the sliders. And I, you know, for hours I played 
with that. And I was putting it all kinds of vectors uh, I had lying around. Um, <clears throat> and accidentally, um, um, accidentally, I uh, I was working on a logo for Kogo, an Estonian art gallery. It was, you know, lying around and since I was feeding to, to the script, uh, everything that was lying around, I also made it go spiral. And the fact that the letters were connected made the whole spiral loopy thing even more expressive, to put it mildly. Uh, and, and, and also it, it, it gave me a satisfaction because, because that, that particular version of the logo was not chosen by the gallery. So it was nice to find, uh, to, 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 it was nice to, to, to have find, to have found some, some purpose for it after all. Uh, yeah. So connected script it was. And when time came to choose the word to be set in our font, the words, one Cyrillic, one Latin, uh, and to choose the name of the font, we pretty much independently came up with, um, the word Liana. It sounds almost the same in both languages, like uh, the, uh, Russian and English, and it's not too long, and there are some repetitive letters. And generally, I mean, what, what else could be? Of course, it was Liana. Uh, also, that word let us reusing the letter A for both scripts, because it looks, A looks the same in Latin and Cyrillic, and in this project, saving on Characters was not an unimportant consideration. As the official description goes, mm, these letter forms nearly suffocated they, their makers who faced engineering a font with 162 masters, which at 16 megabyte is barely able to support 10 characters. Just enough to set the words Liana, Latin, English, and Liana, Cyrillic, Russian. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, dealing with Cyrillic makes me realize again and again how strongly typography reflects the more global aspects of our human life. In times of big uh, changes, of big turmoil, the importance of a language or the way the language is represented in writing often increases radically. And transition from one script to another or, or drastic changes in orthography often accompany big socio-political shifts. A language and idiosyncrasy of its letter shapes can become a means of expression, means of self-identification for a social group. Such idiosyncrasy sometimes becomes a means to fence off from another social group another nation. And given that, the Cyrillic script, in my opinion, has suspiciously many instances. There is the standard Cyrillic, which is corresponding with the Russian Cyrillic preferences, and usually in, in global font industry, it is the one that takes the default position in a font. And the term standard is justified by the fact that it's also used by, by, by plenty other languages in countries which historically were, again, to put it mildly, strongly influenced by Russia in one of its incarnations. And I think this is quite a telling fact by itself. And then there are the local forms of Cyrillic, like Bulgarian Cyrillic, Serbian Cyrillic, Macedonian, Ukrainian Cyrillic, which features not only different construction for certain letters, but in general, it, the, those local faces of Cyrillic, they feature a slightly different attitude to, to, to the proportions and details that formally are the same across different models of, 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 of the Cyrillic script. And those specific accents of the Cyrillic are way too often looked down upon by the Russian typographic school, which in my opinion has grown to be extremely dogmatic in the last 20 years and, 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 and pretty much attempted to monopolize uh, the expertise on Cyrillic. There are a few exceptions luckily, but 
generally those those various accents in Cyrillic are tolerated by the Russian school only if they know their place as as local alternatives. And what is it if not a colonist approach? Uh, you know the, the 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 typographic embodiment of the sense of imperial superiority. I am native to the Russian language, so indeed I am mostly used to the Russian standard Cyrillic. Maybe with some local Latvian coloring, but still it's 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 mostly Russian Cyrillic that that uh, I grew up with. However, my first and determining steps in type design were uh, guided by the Dutch type designer Lucas de Groot in Berlin. Uh, and you know, during my Erasmus year in Berlin, I took his class in Kunsthochschule Weissense, and after that, I did my internship at Lucas Fonts, and after that, I continued working there for quite a while. So I learned type design from Lucas, obviously Latin, but also Cyrillic. And Lucas is a big fan of Cyrillic, and in particular of the Bulgarian Cyrillic. So my first conscious experience designing Cyrillic was with Lucas' guidance. And he used to implement some Bulgarian solutions as the default ones. And, and, and generally he promoted Bulgarian approach. Uh, and yes, Bulgarian letter shapes were somewhat unusual to me, but uh, Lucas' argumentation about why they work better than the Russian Cyrillic, it totally did convince me. If, if, if you are not prejudiced by the reading habit, uh, the Bulgarian letter shapes have many benefits comparing to the Russian Cyrillic. There, there, there are more curves, uh, more dis, uh, descending and ascending elements. There is more differentiation between lowercase and uppercase. Counter spaces are not uh, as cramped as as in some Cyrillic uh, Cyr Russian Cyrillic letters. So, uh, why not Bulgarian? Also, Bulgarian shapes are not completely alien to the rest of the Cyrillic world. They're closely resembling the handwritten construction, which in Cyrillic is quite remote from the Roman or even Italic or cursive uh, construction. It's kind of a third a third uh, uh, modification of the Cyrillic script. Uh, so, you know, I was motivated to get used to the Bulgarian Cyrillic, and so I did. And only later familiarizing with the Russian typographic school, I learned that you know it's 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 not how you do it. It's 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 wrong, and it made me think recently that while the statement "we read best what we read most" as well as "we read most what we read best," it is definitely generally true. But there is a third possibility. Maybe we read best what we are motivated to read, and after all, there are quite a few cases when, when when people were willing to accept drastic changes in their reading habits uh, when they were motivated enough despite all the previous uh, customs and traditions and a good illustration to this process is the implementation of the new orthographies and transition from the black letter and german based orthography to the roman letters with phonemic orthographies phonemic orthographies where for each son there is one one character uh, those processes in the newly formed states in Europe after World War I. Latvia was one of them, as well as our neighbors, uh, Estonia and Lithuania, and, and of course, many more uh, European countries, including Ukraine. Uh, and such a shift didn't come easy. As you can see, for a while, the, the alphabet books for kids had to show all kinds of orthographies and letter styles at the same time, because children could face any of those four options in their life. Um, and, 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 and the alphabet book was supposed to prepare them uh, for, such a, for such a case. But it worked out, and we do use diacritics today in Latvia instead of the you know, bulky clusters of two, three, four, sometimes five letters that were used to represent one sound of the Latvian language in the old German-based orthography. Um, so it is, in principle, possible. Uh, and, you know, 
even if that utopian possibility of the standard Cyrillic loosening up and agreeing to be enriched by other Cyrillic tradition traditions existed, I think that the moment uh, for such an opportunity might be long time gone. Uh, I cannot imagine how an attempt of such enrichment today, after Russia waged that horrid full-scale war on Ukraine, can be anything but an act of a cynical cultural appropriation. So I'm afraid that different branches of Cyrillic script might grow even more apart and crystallize that way. And there is a sad possibility that some of them might cease to exist if their users decide to switch to Latin. Uh, in case of Ukrainian Cyrillic, that would be an automatic act of separation from the aggressor. You know, anything related uh, should be should be gone. And I, I hope it won't happen because Cyrillic belongs to the Ukrainians uh, as much as to any other user of of of, of the Cyrillic script. So. But, okay, it's not for me to discuss. Um, recently, I was approached by Nadine Shanin, the CEO of I Love Typography Platform, with the question whether I'd like to teach a Cyrillic course. And I agreed, feeling the full weight of the responsibility of not indoctrinating the prejudice towards the accents in Cyrillic to the potential participants, especially if it's their first acquaintance with the script. And of course, I in, in, in invited native guest lecturers to give the native input on the different faces uh, on, on, on the Cyrillic script. Uh, Botio Nikolchev for Bulgarian, uh, Jovanna Jocic for Serbian, and Oleksiy Chekal for Ukrainian. But Preparing this course and, and consulting on Cyrillic uh, makes me ask myself all the time, is that particular thing I was going to correct or mark as wrong? Uh, is it actually bad and wrong or is it my bias talking? And in my diacritical uh, uh, workshop, I almost don't use the concept of right and wrong anymore because rightness and wrongness in type design often is a highly conditional thing. And so it is about Cyrillic as well. Uh, and, you know, well-designed Cyrillic or well-designed diacritics is again rather a range than just one point, in my opinion. So those who are still listening, thank you very much. It was a pleasure and I hope you found something useful. I will stop sharing my screen. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and, and you can see in, in the chat, hopefully, uh, the wonderful um, uh, comments. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and the, the, I, I really appreciate your generosity and, and, and the construction of the talk and, and Talking about something that's quite complex and obviously super important, and and you bring up a lot of the issues that uh, I think a lot of people are struggling through, and just just even um, thinking through, and I think even even you know, kind of uh, uh, outside of the format of this, we talked about like the the a topic like this, you know, um, timeliness of topics like this, and the appropriateness of of things like this. But I, I appreciate um, that that we can uh, do talks like this and we can talk about subject matter. And I, I, I share your sentiment in, about the, you know, obviously um, native speaker as well. And, and I share that, that, um, that space of, of the nativeness of Cyrillics. And, and I do hope that um, in the, the movement that that's happening, that the, the language will survive and, and certainly within Ukraine, um, that Cyrillics will, will continue to be used. And, and I think this is going to be a very, uh, trying period because it, it is 
um, as you say so pointedly, like the association with with Russia um, as kind of like the host of that script has become pretty pretty strong. I think um, 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 and and the the variants of Cyrillic do exist outside of it, and and certainly does not just belong to to them. In fact, you know, kind of came to you know it, when it when Cyrillic arrived there, um, it was quite quite a different landscape, both both culturally, historically, and and, and politically. So it, it's not um, owned by any one entity, but it certainly has become very much uh, uh, an imperialist mindset that has kind of shifted. Yeah. So I'm I'm hopeful uh, <clears throat> that it does stay. Yeah, you know, it's. I would not want to go further in the uh, Ukrainian Cyrillic topic because it should be discussed by Ukrainian designer. But just one last thing, it, you know, I, I, I think that that it would be fantastic if 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 Ukrainian Cyrillic could redefine the idea of Cyrillic that that Cyrillic would be associated with Ukraine in the first place rather than, than, than Russia and that would be like one of the victories that for 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 Ukraine you know that, that it's yeah yeah and I think like absolutely yeah. and I think like the what, what you said in terms of like what we read best like what we are motivated to and I think like I hope really um that the motivation to to read Ukrainian uh will will stay and I think we're sort of you know it, we're I think we're seeing certainly resurrection of of, of the oh, yeah. uh, influence yeah. of, of that yeah. and this the the interest by by the population i think like the numbers of have, have significantly risen even even pre um, 2022 um there's there's some questions i, I would love to, mm -hmm. to, to take some some um um maybe the the first one just just um capturing something that was asked qu quite early on i i believe uh nikita asked a question um in terms of like the different design of the f the cyrillic f i yeah. think that's in the context of what you were showing with the ibm plex um why didn't you use a different design uh for the f consisting of a single circle across vertically and i think that's probably the first part of your presentation yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why it didn't work right yeah. Well, I could have, but I decided not to because I had reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, I had, yeah, because, well, reasons and let's say bra uh, 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 the boldness to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, Lucas asked the question, uh, you mentioned varying levels of rigidity amongst the scripts you design. Do more flexible mm -hmm. scripts invite more appropriation and or poor design choices by non-natives? That's a good question. A good question. Unfortunately, I have no good answers to because uh, I think you can misinterpret both aspects, the fluidity and the rigidness uh, 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 in the you know, equ equally badly, <laughs> uh, and 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 uh, indeed, uh, Greek, in my uh, experience, uh, suffers from being overly boxified and Cyrillic. You know, it it has the the the, the opposite uh, faith. Uh, Non-native designers often try to kind of artificially add some 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 softer corners where they don't belong. I mean, then 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 better just. Just, just do Bulgarian uh, uh, shapes. Th th those are perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly doing what you want to do. But just don't add some random roundings here and there, <laughs> where where they only confuse the, the the reader. But I, of course, I don't also don't want to discourage from experiment. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, non-native designers they 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 off often actually they bring uh, uh, some fresh ideas into a script and 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 things that were considered uh, completely wrong 10 years ago in Cyrillic you know by now they become they have they 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 are their their trends their 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 kind of fresh uh, accents to 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 some typefaces so things change also mm -hmm. Um, there's another question. Um, Grant asked, um, "Do you uh, do do any native Greek type designers uh, protest when you're commissioned for Greek?" Which I guess is like a much broader question too, in terms of your your the the general premise of your your talk about yeah. the native like appropriateness of designing a language. Good question. I don't know. I don't know those Greek type designers. I I speak to uh, 
uh, they don't protest. They they encourage me <laughs> to, to do so. But also for, for the protocol, I very rarely take Greek commissions. Uh, um, I, I'm asked more often than 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 to, to, to do Greek than I actually do Greek. I usually only take uh, the projects that have some personal interest for me or, or you know in case of IBM Plex Serif I was already involved in in in, in that in that uh, in that project and uh, uh, and in in most cases I redirect those uh, uh, requests to to the Greek colleagues and mm. yeah uh, that's probably my answer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would be curious to know if they do protest <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't. Mm -hmm. And you know, it takes me so much nerves and 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 doubts and 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 generally, it's so much more energy consuming to design for Greek than for Latin or Cyrillic that it's just also I I I, I prefer I I don't I don't like to <laughs> no I, I I do enjoy it but uh, uh, I cannot afford emotionally to to design. Greek all the time because it's just asked me requires too much too much energy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's 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 also there's the, it it the practical um, commercial constraints or expectations I guess from type design in kind of a highly globalized society in, in the world we live in is, is you know thousands of glyphs and, and and encompassing and covering languages and and so it it it's it's hard to do that with that without some familiarity with with those languages but certainly there's a, a really broad world of people who are experts and in, 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 in native to those scripts and that could be but brings up the the you know is it can you afford to have 10, 15, sometimes 20, 30 and more consultants to, you know, it, it obviously depends on the scale of the project and the budgets. You know, I imagine something like IBM is a little bit more or Google fonts can be kind of a, but, but it's certainly logistically quite, quite a heavy lift to involve a lot of people, but having some familiarity and maybe like some, some sensitivity to, um, um, understanding of, of, but also I do wonder in terms of, um, and, and this kind of maybe goes into kind of the 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 range of experimentation, you know, being yeah. non-native, certainly not wanting to offend, but um, kind of introducing interesting ideas potentially formally that kind of challenge some, you know. And I think like you 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 showed a few things like um, like the the design, like the the reverse contrast that that Irini kind of pushed back on, but then sort of found a way into something else you know do you think that something like that the reverse contrast idea um you were able to kind of get to that just because of like that that distance maybe that you have to to the, the greek script you could call it a distance i would say like maybe a certain naivety <laughs> <laughs> rather but yeah but you know it's 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 i think a greek designer would be more uh, time efficient and 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 would know where to go right away without those those you know unnecessary uh, uh, unnecessary uh, deviations and as I you know as as I said I I am not sure whether it actually was beneficial for the project or we just enjoyed the ride because I I have to admit that secretly Mike and I we still kind of love that reverse contrast. <laughs> <laughs> version a lot <laughs> maybe it will find find uh some place in 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 some other context but you know we, we still are a little bit attached to it so i i, I don't regret uh, uh doing that but uh yeah efficiency probably is not the the word that could be <laughs> uh used in the context of of, of, of this kind of um uh very loopy path to the to the final result <laughs> and i i guess this 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 seems like a a, a good uh follow-up question lucas asked uh, about experimentation uh in latin display faces are allowed to be pretty wild in your experiences that approach is welcome in other cultures for other scripts 
Uh, and maybe this is also something that the folks watching can can kind of chime in and chat. But from your experience, do do you see that? Definitely, uh, definitely. But uh, there, you know, the, the the wilder your display face is, the more you might need a native uh, consultant because, you know, well, as type designers, we are we are in a funny position we are we are limited uh by um we're limited by the recognizability of the letters in even in the most display typeface the the the, the letter should be should be recognized even well if it takes like a few seconds to look at it but but at the end it should be recognized as a letter unless well other, otherwise the typeface will become a very nice pattern which is also nice but um if we want it to, if it, it it has to keep some functionality, and in 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 very wild display cases, um, that 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 question whether the letter is recognizable or not, it's 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 very difficult to judge for a non-native reader. So you know you, that that's where 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 you are. Um, or your native consultant is 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 required just to kind of to check whether it's the 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 level of readability of that other script is uh, uh, adequate to the for well to, to 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 your own script right if you design for Latin and and decide to design uh, a Cyrillic extension uh, for a wild uh, display typeface. Uh, uh, you might be able to evaluate the readability of the Latin part much better than the Cyrillic part. So, you, you, yeah, it's it's good to to to, to get a, an answer from 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 a native reader or native expert. Mm -hmm. And I think also like the 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 ac uh, accessibility and and i guess access to tools you know which i think is also changing quite a bit and and it's really great to see in your talk the the use of um uh, you know drawbot and and kind of python scripting which which has enabled um a lot of a lot of really great things to happen certainly like the uh, space of animation you know like the you're seeing more and more digital display and and especially like literally displaying of display typography yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. like a poster now could move you know because we're 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 seeing more and more screens uh where the the printed space i mean certainly i'm i'm more old fashioned and i i do love print and and i think even even the younger generation certain kind of reconnecting with the physicality ephemerality of it but certainly we're we're subways and and trains and and like there's just digital displays and everything is moving and so there's these wonderful opportunities to have things kind of um it, it's it's creating kind of a, a completely different lens in a way too of, of how language you know and there's a lot of really interesting subtleties that that can happen certainly mutability of languages you know in a particular yeah, yeah absolutely yeah shift. yeah I, th I think i know what you what you mean yeah and uh i i see that too yeah Especially, you know, like think thinking of of places where there's, um, you know, most global societies are are are, are moving, and and there's, yeah, you know, I think in most countries there's there's a presence of of other languages, and so having that, you know, certainly living in New York, that's that's very evident, and in places like Berlin and other big cities, but you know, especially like a public from a public standpoint, you know, being able to publish things in multiple languages, and and being able to do that really to relatively quickly with 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 the sensitivity to how that that looks but do you do that like if it's a very heavy kind of expressive display thing can you do that 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 elegantly transfers one to the other i mean it's like it seems like a it's it's where we're going to see that um and and and, and probably pretty soon i imagine like the the dominance kind of of, of latin is still you know pr pretty strong um, but yeah. I think there's challenges mm -hmm. to that happening all over. But do you think it's a purely typographic uh, tendency, or there are like other aspects of 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 life that that are are pushing us towards that kind of uh, 
future that you described? Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. Like I am apprehensive and skeptical, but um, I I do think that there's some interesting. Like I think people. I guess I guess like I would imagine that it's like sort of people driving. And I think again, you know, certainly um even within that like the, the sort of the power structures who's who's making the decisions and financially of course you know and i think um Rand brings up a point in, in in chat like in terms of the the tools being accessible you know like what you know who's making those tools and, and who, who's who's providing those tools i mean i'm i'm, I'm very happy to see a, a really large um open source and and um community and and kind of a very generous uh, community that that's that's providing tools but we're still not there um there's still subscriptions and certainly kind of barriers to to access and even even education um absolutely course. you know when i was preparing this talk i i i i i i wrote that phrase that that um nowadays uh pretty much everyone is native to the latin script even if you are growing up in a different writing system and then i was thinking well you're looking from your relatively privileged point of view because if if, if you're a type designer you you probably had the means to you know to buy a laptop to 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 buy a few sub subscriptions and 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 and, and uh, you have access to internet so yes in that case you will be exposed to the latin script <laughs> for sure but it's it's not always the case but yeah yeah, so 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 not not everyone, even. Uh, yeah, not everyone has means uh, to, to be a type design type designer and therefore to be exposed to the Latin script. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. a little clum, 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 clumsily uh, put thought, but uh, no, yeah. no, it ma makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, like that you, you mentioned, I think the way I really like the framing that you use, like the motivation part, you know, because the. Yeah that there's the familiarity but there's also like being motivated to to be able to do it there's there's a there's a big difference between being able to see read process and and kind of um be sensitive to and and the whole other level to being able to actually like draw and and correct in being able to spot certain things that's why you know the, yeah. the, the learning curve for type design education is still pretty pretty steep and requires quite a bit of time and effort and and insight and teaching you know so but but i am i am i'm definitely optimistic just seeing like how much more uh since zoom and kind of online um spaces have opened up i think technologically you know um pre-covid um the 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 zoom technology i mean obviously literally we're we're, we're doing this right now yeah. would 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 as as advanced as technology has been um you know but but pre 2020 pre covid like it wasn't as progressed as as it has now and so now there's there's a lot more um you know things that can happen hopefully it will be a little bit more um in terms of yeah yeah <laughs> um mm -hmm. i think pro we probably have maybe just just time for one more question i want to be mindful of everyone's time but um mm -hmm. Let's there is a question from Will Schuster. Hi, Will. Um, do you find uh, that native Latin designers impose a Latin accent when experimenting with display styles in other scripts? And if so, how would they? How could they avoid that? That's an interesting question. Ah. <laughs> well, you know, we all impose some accent to anything we do right so it's 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 kind of it's normal also <laughs> I, I would say uh also the question is whether imposing a latin accent per se is a bad thing uh and you know how how, how could we avoid that uh if, if indeed if you don't want it to be like overly uh, latinized I, I i would say uh you know we we cannot become native to a script we didn't grow up with i think i think i don't know but i think we can kind of compensate a little bit by just looking at as many instances of that script as we can so kind of repeating uh, what 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 we do with our own script but but then with the other script just just you know just look at it in all kind of um uh uh uh, situations. Uh, I sometimes open Google Maps and go through the streets, you know, of of some 
Greek cities or or even <laughs> Bulgarian uh, cities when I want to kind of to, to see. Uh, and I learned that from Lucas de Groot, by the way, uh, that that you just, you know, you, you do that uh, um, uh, uh, online uh, tour <laughs> through, through the place uh, uh, where a certain tradition originates. And that is one of the... Uh, one of the ways how to familiarize a little bit with with the script, or even you know just with a language with a, with 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 an alphabet, because as as I mentioned, the, the the Latin script it contains so much. Even you know we we are not used to call experts when we uh, uh, design Karen or or Diresis or 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 Macron, but maybe we should, <laughs> or maybe we should at least pay some some you know some some extra attention uh, especially in display typefaces by the way because it's also it's 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 a field where you can have much more um much more um uh, flexibility and freedom and 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 you know if, if if you don't look at the diacritics as some kind of boring production at the end of the of the process it it can the, the thinking of diacritics uh, in 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 display typefaces can become a source of inspiration. You know, like like you you, you can you can find some uh, some solutions that will influence your your base letters and and, and 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 yeah. So it's it's also kind of a healthy way to refresh a little bit your uh, design process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of seeing it as a whole as a whole picture. It's not as just... a whole picture. Yeah, or even just starting with diacritics for change. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if, if, if we talk about diacritics, yeah, 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 yeah. because it's, it's you know diacritics they, they they stick out and it's what I call a holy grail of type design to <laughs> to make them not stick out. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and it's 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 you know with diacritics above the letters, it's a little easier because you can make those letters sit uh, like uh, uh, shorter and, and and put diacritical marks within the capital X height but with sedia with comma accent with things that are hanging below it's 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 more difficult because the, the baseline then will be jumping and you know so uh yeah just starting to so to solve those problems can 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 lead you to uh to some interesting desi uh, designs even if we only uh, uh, we'll look at the at the at the basic uh, Latin alphabet part. Sorry, I now jumped into my diacritics workshop mo mode. So I... <laughs> <laughs> that's great. No, I think I think that's a really good. Um, it's it's I think the good kind of sentiment to to, to end the talk on, and, and <laughs> certainly like for folks um, who want to explore more and, and kind of plugging uh, the work that you, Alexander, are doing, like you're you're teaching courses and and. Uh, providing this kind of expertise and and at least you know in in a very open-minded way you know I think like that's that's really what's what's great to see is like the generosity of your experience but also like you bring in in people um as you mentioned the um the three um um uh individuals you you brought into to to um I love typography course you know that that's you know sharing and 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 giving people other people platforms who are who are like have another kind of expertise and sort of mixing mixing it all together so for folks watching you know certainly seek that out if, if you're doing that work don't be afraid to to try things um I think is a Definitely. good thing with um be mindful and be sensitive but um it, it's 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 I think we're all humans. I think the more human exchange we have, the the better the world will be. <laughs> uh, let's hope, let's hope all these terrible wars will will end, um, and things can 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 continue to flourish, and languages can continue, and certainly cultures can continue to to, to flourish. Because the beauty of languages is is that it, it's an inherent part of culture, and so you know the the the, the beautiful variety of, of cultures that we have, and, and the ability to experience them through those languages is is essential. So we 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 hope that that can happen sometime soon. With with that, I will close out here, and thank you so much, Alexander, for, for your time for experience. Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you so much for everyone who who listened. <laughs> thank you. That's it was a pleasure. And folks, like if you wanted to click the YouTube link, you can see the video and it's recording. And then in a week or two, we'll have the this this video uploaded and we'll hope to see everyone in the summer. So thanks again. Have a great rest of the spring. Take care.